months at a time. I think that some of them, it's enjoyment. They just, I mean, it's, it's a chance for them because we're finding more and more firearms, more and more everything else. And there's just, like we found, I was with uh, Dr. Gabriel when we found the bear and, and Mark. And, um, you know, I mean, there's no rhyme or reason to why they did what they did to that bear. Um, and this is the public safety. And again, why we have the, the chemicals up there, again, is it, it, it's a threat to everyone, not just the animals. I can speak for myself. This year was a bad year. Um, we had numerous officers that were exposed to this chemical, myself included, and I'll be honest with you, it's not a pleasant experience. And, um, you know, and it doesn't matter, I, I consider myself to be a pretty cautious person, and, you know, it doesn't only really take a second to make a mistake. And the sad thing with this is that it also affected the guys that were in the grow site that we arrested. They had poured it directly into a uh, water system, and we're using it to spray on the plants. These guys were washing their faces and brushing their teeth with this stuff. So, and I mean, it's, I mean, even them, it, again, they're getting these folks in. I mean, I couldn't even imagine what the long term effect of that would be. Um, you know, we're getting these folks now that it's, we're, I think, as an agency and all of those agencies, and again, I have to say this as well. I mean, this is the Department of Fish and Wildlife. We can't do this without the United States Forest Service. Uh, BLM, the sheriff's departments, we all work together to try to make sure that we can fight this battle together. And um, and what we're seeing now is a lot of these guys, they're patrolling because they don't want people, I mean, it's, it's again, as we, I heard earlier, it, in my opinion, it's about greed. And it, it's all about money for these folks and at any cost. And again, think of yourself being that person walking around that corner as a hiker, just out recreating and having a good time to run into these guys. All armed, I don't know if you can see that from the slide. I mean, it's just, it's becoming almost too too much of a problem. Firearms, like I said, we're seeing more and more firearms all the time. Um, in areas that we normally have been pretty mundane, we found people that are just, I mean, and the firearms that they're carrying are things that, you know, yeah, we wear bulletproof vests, but the reality of it is when we're hiking in and doing this stuff, we can't wear that, we can't up armor because it's just, Otherwise, we, we can't carry enough water. So, I mean, they can definitely take this up. One of the things we're finding, too, is a lot more booby traps. You know, that's just an example of one. The biggest one that they like to play with are fish hooks. Again, it's not just endemic to law enforcement. It's because biologists, if you're out there doing these things, potentially you can run into these things. One of the things that I was really surprised at is the fish hooks. And in Monterey County, which is the area where I work predominantly was, uh, it's, we're seeing more and more of that, and um, we just have to be cautious. Um, so kind of breaking down what it is, is how it works is it's broken up into two teams at this point. There's the watershed enforcement team, which is, um, Lieutenant Little is the one who's in charge of that, and then myself that works on the um, marijuana enforcement team. I, well, I actually, I wear two hats. I work on both sides. I help Wayne in it. With us, it's actually a joint effort. Um, and then as we get into that further, I think there's another component that I'll break down. But historically, what it is with um, the warden since we started out, our main role was to just do basically eradication, which is to go in and chop the plants and go. We're finding, and I, we're seeing now, that that's, it's not working. Because when you go in there and you leave that infrastructure, you take the plants, what's going to happen a lot of times is these folks are going to come right back in Plant, hook up their water lines or whatever it is, they're back in business. A perfect example, I worked, uh, was a detail called the Corp Press. I was on a reclamation team and it was broken up. The eradication team went in first. They eradicated all the plants. We went in four days later to go do the reclamation. They already had a new plan. Back in business. Four days. And there's law enforcement crawling everywhere, helicopters flying everywhere. They're not afraid. It's, it's they're just, it's, it, it's, it's a battle that's going to be a very, very tough one for us to fight. Um, and currently, um, the MET team was created basically to take a more active role in addressing the environmental impacts caused by these grow sites. As an agency, I see a direct nexus to what we do. I guess I'm kind of the, the screwball in the loop because I really believe in doing reclamation. Um, it's not the most glorious thing to do, but the thing is, is when you walk away from these sites, we walk away knowing that we left them dirt 
And um, as you saw with the pictures with uh, Dr. Weber, I was able to work with him this entire summer. And um, and you see these areas when we found those those all that rodenticide hiding. It was horrible. But the thing is, is knowing that after we went through and cleaned that up, to know that there's actually animals that are being able to walk through there again and not have to deal with that stuff. I mean, it sounds kind of silly, but our role is to be there for the animals and protect them. Um, so one of the things that I think is, it, it's been really great, and I have to say this now, is that it was an honor to work with Dr. Gabriel this summer. Um, I'm very new to the team. I actually started um, basically at the beginning of the season, and they came up to me and said, what do you think about working with the scientists?
to develop a strategic plan on how to deal with the situation. In fall, we formed uh, the fall 2013 we formed a working group. In November, we, we filed for joint uh, BCP uh, for positions. Basically, there were a lot of cake, a lot of, a lot of cake. Uh, 11 water quality positions, seven uh, fish and wildlife positions, and uh, money for uh, what's called uh, SIPs. It's a continuous identification program. And that's using high resolution GIS imagery to, uh, to track and monitor these growths and the change throughout time. So, we have a wet staff, that's myself, two boards, environmental scientists, and assistant government program analysts, and an attorney to cover basically the entire state. <coughs> we tried to, we work hand in hand with the water board, and what we've done, what we've done is we're trying to, we started initially by responding to complaints, water fish grows, uh, a lot of a large footprint with grading and so forth, um, LA agency complaints and so forth, and we got ourselves a little fine tuned that way. As I mentioned earlier, we developed a strategy, we decided how we were going to deal with enforcement and, and so forth. The strategy was to focus on the ML Triangle uh, and basically which encompasses Region 1 of uh, the Water Board and Region 5 of the Water Board and the Central Valley. A lot of people wonder why, why is the Department or why is Water Quality Control Board dealing with marijuana? Well, really, if you look at it, the impact is not much different than our culture industry or other uh, construction. You know, there are, but there are legal entities surrounding marijuana and uh, you know, those, those issues, whether it's recognized by the federal government, it's legal in the state of California for medicinal purposes, and then you've got 58 counties who can't decide how to get together and regulate it. So you've got, you just got this just mess, and, and they're falling between the cracks. Um, we can, but we can address the water quality concerns. We can uh, deal with this like any other business or any other entity that, that messes up our water, that, has discharges and so forth by regulating their activities, not the cultivation of cannabis so much, but the activities associated with it. The Water Board has its set of liabilities that, that they can uh, ensue uh, using uh, clean up abatement orders, uh, using Clean Water Act and so forth, filing administrative fines, using the Attorney General's Office for uh, referrals or uh, to health compliance and so forth. Uh, their fines can go to hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes. For years, all we had to do was resort to the uh, the criminal statutes. And basically, if you violated a stream bed alteration agreement, if you polluted or if you dumped, uh, excuse me, if you uh, littered, you're looking at a maximum fine if you're real lucky of $2,000. This gentleman over here asked earlier, well, why did it take us so long to get to this point where we're doing something? Well, again, this, with, in, with, prop, with passing Prop 215, we saw the problem. We knew what was going on, but it was kind of staying under the radar and then basically started growing exponentially over the last five to eight years. And with that, we were playing catch up. We had to develop these programs. We had to find the funding. We had to find the personnel and the staff. In order to create my team, we had to take two wardens out of two. My team and, and the team that, uh, that Paul associated with, we had to take 13 wardens and three lieutenants out of the general population of wardens <coughs> with really no replacement. We had to take two yet, two years of environmental scientists to, find my, to, to, to support my team. With, uh, without really replacing them at this point in time. And so by doing that, we were able to reallocate funds to, to deal with the problem, but uh, in the long term, we're, we're uh, short staffed on the other side. And that causes a lot of internal battles in itself. So when we get to our liability, we have a fishing game uh, code that we can deal with and so forth. But what's really needed in, in this last year is that fishing game Pro Bowl 25 was um, amended, and we Became, we have this strong uh, civil authority to, to seek uh, administrative action. And some of the fines can go anywhere from $8,000 to $40,000, depending on what the violation is. $8,000 for a, a landowner who has a 1,600 violation on his property. If you're committing a trespass, 1,600 violation of street alteration on your property, it could be as much as $16,000. $20,000 for litter and uh, pollution, and $40,000 if you're uh, trespassing. Well, that makes a complete change in the whole spectrum of how we deal with things. So our strategy, we formulate the strategy, the strategic plan, we determine what our limitations, our roles and responsibilities, we propose an implementation, implementation plan. And what we're trying to do is, I'll, I'll try to gloss through this real quick, but we, we rolled into the uh, inspection process. And the inspection process initially was to hone in on a couple of growths, fine tune our skills, and then attack the watershed. 
We wanted to get the most bang for our buck. We wanted to go into a watershed and see what kind of change we could make if we targeted a watershed that had critical habitat that, that was where the, where the resource was being significantly hampered. And so we, we knew that these inspections would be time, time intensive, that resources are limited and so forth. And I'll let you read through the rest here. But um, this would be a highly coordinated effort between, between the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Water Board, Sheriff's offices, and local county environmental health. Cal Fire also, and uh, our resources for it. So the Water Board sat down and they developed a plan for, in the short term, uh, about using the basin plan and conditional waivers and so forth, and using conditional uh, cleanup abatement orders. So ultimately, we were looking at a long term so uh, solution fee structure that they were going to implement depending on where you fall in several tiers of, uh, of uh, potential impact and, uh, based on the size of your operation and its impact on the resource and again the conditional waiver issue. And so what we needed more than that was education outreach and that was the strongest component of what we were looking at and we, we are continually um, working through there. Okay, so the education outreach, we, uh, this golden fish pamphlet real quick here. Basically, here was something that I found in Washington State to deal with recreational mining. We were going to adopt that to our program and have a, uh, it's basically BMPs for uh, marijuana cultivation. And that would be a means by which we could uh, uh, helpfully get the information out there from the transient community in a lot of, a lot of areas and perhaps get the information to better uh, give them that information to better protect the resource. Again, as I mentioned earlier, all the entities involved in our program uh, has been highly coordinated and there's a lot of effort going on. Um, again, how are we going to clean up these messes if the landowner does take responsibility and so forth? And we have to look at these sources of funding. Uh, Cal Recycle, for instance, Timber Restoration Fund. Uh, how can we uh, get those monies to keep a lot of these landowners the only way we go after them is them in the property. They'll, they'll disappear from the state. They don't really care because they, the, the $40,000 they may have spent on a remote parcel is nothing compared to the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Again, we get back to the cleanup options and how we're going to deal with the problem and, and remove the toxins from the environment. Lastly, the challenges we have uh, to deal with landowners and, and the migratory nature of growers, the hazardous waste and cleanup and so forth, legal, legal water diversions, and our earthwork we saw that the earthwork contractors, that was a significant place along with the realtors and the uh, um, other folks involved in uh, monitoring, in uh, assisting these people in, uh, in altering their property or acquiring their property, making them more accountable. So we were able to go out, possibly go after them with the uh, water board civil liability issues and uh, perhaps uh, make them more of a deterrent. Current successes, and this is hopefully my last slide. Um, we've conducted about 24 inspections to date, 16 of which were uh, in the Sprout Creek range last week. Um, we organized 35, uh, 34 five member team with Humboldt County Sheriff's Office, Humboldt County Environmental Health, Fish and Wildlife, Environmental Scientists, Fish and Wildlife, Met and Wet uh, Wardens, and uh, the Water Board, and we assaulted on 14 parcels that we had administrative warrants for. Um, we, had, we were well received. We had no incidents, we had no injuries, we had no lost persons, and we had got two additional um, uh, voluntary inspections which made it a total of 16. Uh, that was a success for us. It's a stepping stone for where we're going in the future. I know it took a long time in coming, but we're, we're getting there, and now we have to file this process up through the, uh, through the uh, administrative law uh, avenues and see what happens. It's, it's not over yet, and, and we have a lot of work Thank you. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, we'll do a uh, our next speaker is uh, the Assistant Special Agent in Charge uh, with the U.S. Forest Service at the Central.